turn then to Paul's second letter to his good friend Timothy, which would turn out to be the last letter that Paul ever wrote. Paul starts in typical fashion, introducing himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. He sends his friend grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Despite writing to a close friend, Paul feels compelled to use this rather formal introduction. He's claiming apostolic authority, but he clarifies what that means. Apostleship in the New Testament means persecution, long walks, servanthood to the church, and ultimately a martyr's death. But Paul's apostleship was according to the life that Jesus demonstrated, a life of complete servanthood to God. Paul desires certain things for Timothy that are eternal and spiritual. He wants Timothy to understand what he has through faith in Christ. It's very easy for us who live in a physical world to focus on the physical things, and to find comfort in them. But Paul here is seeking to turn Timothy's mind and heart to eternal things. He says, I'm convinced that you have the faith that brings these eternal values into your life. Paul specifically states that he is recalling Timothy's tears. So clearly, there were some things that were bothering Timothy. The most obvious is that he was separated from Paul, who was in prison for his life. That would have been bad enough. But Timothy was 200 miles away from his home. He was in Ephesus, a large city compared to his home city of Lystra. He'd been sent to Ephesus by Paul for a specific purpose. So here he was, a stranger, far away from home, correcting respected men of the church, almost all of whom were older than he was. Add to that, his personality was somewhat retiring and shy. Despite the challenges he faced, Timothy was being encouraged by Paul to overcome whatever might come his way. Challenges don't just disappear. There will always be things that can dishearten us. We are in a spiritual battle and the enemy is persistent. But Paul reminds Timothy that he possesses a real faith, and because Timothy is a child of God, he needs to redefine the physical challenges in light of the spiritual realities. Paul reminds Timothy that, based on his faith, he has a gift that he needs to grow through use. The gifts of God are the evidence of the Holy Spirit's powerful presence. Obviously, Paul was well aware of his best friend's timidity and shyness, so he further encourages Timothy with a reassurance of strength from the indwelling spirit. He said, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We can trust God to work through our weakness in his power to accomplish what he desires, but he cannot do it through us if we are unwilling to put our gifts to use. As Max Lusado delightfully expressed it, fear doesn't want you to make the journey to the mountain. If he can rattle you enough, fear will persuade you to take your eyes off the peak and settle for the dull existence in the flatlands. As his final letter, and Paul almost certainly knew this was his final letter as he sits in a Roman jail facing a death sentence, he is effectively making out a last will and testament. It's fair to say that Paul didn't have vast sums of money, property or lots of goods. But that didn't mean he didn't have a powerful legacy that he hoped to pass on. Paul knew that at just about any moment, Nero was going to take his head, so he was desperate to pass on his final instructions. 
he wastes no time in encouraging Timothy to hold on to what is important. Hold on to what you have. Hold on to what you know. Hold on to the one who gave you these things in the first place. Hold on to what you have. Paul brings to mind the legacy that his young protege, Timothy, had. And that was the fortunate circumstance of growing up in a family of faith. His grandmother, Lois, and his mother, Eunice, both understood the gifts of God and had brought Timothy up to understand that. Hold on to what you know, and that means you don't need any new gospel. The Bible says that we will suffer, that's part of the legacy. But the Bible also says that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. When we are strong, we are strong in ourselves, but when we're weak, we are strong in God. Knowing that the God of power and might is living in me gives me all sorts of power to hold on to. It's easy to hold on when you truly know who is holding you. Suffering and struggling is a chance to grow. Our job isn't to live in luxury. Our job is to testify to the Lord and Saviour who is God of all. We need to understand that testifying to the glory of our God is what we are all about. There isn't anything new here, because a real legacy doesn't change. If we are faithful to follow this, we are on the surest foundation we can be. This book is nothing but a reminder of the gifts that God has already given you. This gift, the grace of knowing that you have been redeemed and given eternal life through Jesus Christ, through faith and not through any work of your own, this is the real legacy. Hold on through the one who holds you. In the end, not only has he given you the answers, he's given you the power to succeed as well. Paul says, hold tightly to the pattern of truth I taught you, especially concerning the faith and love Jesus Christ offers you. Guard well the splendid, God-given ability you received as a gift from the Holy Spirit who lives within you. This is the same Spirit who Paul has just said is able to keep everything he's been given until that day, that is, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the end, when we abide in him, we abide in the one who gives us the power to live. He's given you more than life, more than you can handle. He gives it abundantly. Whatever you're going through, whatever challenges you're facing, however much you may feel like you're struggling, live for him and let him live through you. Testify that the one who lives in you is your spirit of power. If we're very honest, I think many people, if asked what their target for life is, would primarily be survival. I just want to get through the day. I just want to weather the storm. Do I have what it takes to make it? Am I going to survive my calling? We often talk about the Christian life as a race, but am I going to make it across the finish line? A lot of people are going through some very tough times, physically, financially, emotionally. We need to learn how to handle the hardships of life. Paul said that we should suffer together with someone, to join the ranks of those who suffer. Paul is not, uh, life is not always comfortable. In fact, the legendary author C.S. Lewis wrote, I don't go to religion to make me happy. If you want a religion to make you really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. Living for Christ is tough. God, through Paul, 
provides insight to those who will listen using three illustrations. Be a good soldier. A soldier has to train, battle and please his commanding officer. He doesn't dabble in trivial things, arguments or pettiness. He has a singleness of purpose. Sadly, some soldiers of the church have gone absent without leave. Some probably need to be dishonourably discharged. We need to stop trying to please ourselves or other people and focus on the commander-in-chief like a good soldier. Be like a disciplined athlete. Every good athlete has targets and goals invariably about running the race to the best of their ability. To do this they must do two things, they must train hard and they must finish strong. There are no shortcuts to effectiveness. Be like a hard-working farmer. Every farmer understands the principle of sowing and reaping. Sow when the ground is ready to receive the seed and reap when the harvest is ready. And so it is with the gospel. We will often have to prepare the ground carefully before we can sow the seed of the gospel. And we will have to wait patiently for the Holy Spirit to bring the harvest. Let's be honest, life is not always fair. At times it's decidedly unfair. Here is Paul, who is one of the greatest Christians of all time, drawing near the end of his life. He's been very faithful since his miraculous conversion. And yet he's in a dark, dreary, dismal dungeon, dealt with like an animal. You never know what God is accomplishing through your hardship. Paul's sufferings would be the means God used to bring others to salvation. Paul then tells Timothy that he must strive to be accepted and blessed by God. He said, work hard so God can say to you, well done. Be a good workman, one who does not need to be ashamed when God examines your work. Know what his word says and means, steer clear of foolish discussions that lead people into the sin of anger with each other. To be accepted or approved by God means to be tried and tested and proven. We must know and show that we are approved. The first area to show approval is study. That verse again, this time from the authorised version. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We must study God's word. Not just read it like a book, but study and dig deep into the word. God's word will reveal itself to you in so many ways that you can never learn it all. We are encouraged to be a craftsman that does not need to be ashamed, but cutting straight the word of truth. There are carpenters and then there are craftsmen. The second area to show approval is our conversation. I'm always very sad when Christians seem to think nothing of taking God's name in vain. Not only is it a commandment, but surely his name is far too precious to take lightly. Any time you hear a Christian using profanity or arguing or debating unfruitful matters, they are not being approved unto God. Foolish conversation will lead to ungodliness. Paul says, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. The word unto means being taken from one place and being brought into another place. Swearing, blasphemy and foolish conversation will take you from righteousness and lead you to unrighteousness. 
Next, we're encouraged to know that we are approved. Obviously, there is immediate encouragement with the clear implication that we can know. There is so much uncertainty in the world. It is great to know that there is something we can know. How do we know that we're approved? First, we must examine ourselves. You know you better than anyone else except God. Is Jesus really Lord of your life? Or is that just what you want us to see on a Sunday? Examine yourself to see if you're meeting God's expectations. The Bible tells us to not just focus on appearing approved, but to do that which is honest, to know that you're approved. When God approves me, I learn some things. I learn to rejoice in my spiritual position. I learn to pray frequently and effectively. I learn to thank God for everything in my life, even the bad, where I can see his hand leading and teaching. I learn to listen to the Spirit and let him lead me and bring all matters to truth. I learn to hold on to what is good in my life. Now that I know and show approval, I am required to walk in approval status. I am required to live and talk in the right way. Before the Lord approved me, I had to examine myself, and I found I didn't match up. I was angry, I was depressed, I was negative and critical. I was just unpleasant. But when I decided to get God's approval, that's when my life changed, because I knew it had to. Now my life has changed, and I am enjoying the blessing of being approved by the Lord. Jesus paid the price, and when I accepted him, God accepted me. I can thank God for being approved of the Lord. Paul tackles the issue of Christians who were caught up in false teaching and of Christians caught up in worldliness and instructs us as believers as to how we can be used of God. Within virtually every local congregation there exists a mixture of professed believers and true believers. God knows those who are truly his. Salvation does not begin with man. It begins with God. He planned it. He executed it. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. God knows us better than we know ourselves. The psalmist said, You have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. Nothing is hidden from God, everything is clearly seen. God knows us because he created us. God expects those who are his to live right. Paul was very clear in writing, A person who calls himself a Christian should not be doing things that are wrong. Profession of Christ as Lord shows itself to be a genuine possession of him as one's life by a changed life. If you belong to God's family, you ought to act like you belong to God's family. We are to depart from, stand off from, forsake, and withdraw. Separate ourselves from anything and everything that is not right, that is sin, that is displeasing to God. We are to avoid sin, and we're also to avoid anything that looks like sin. 
You'll not have to resist the committing of sin face to face if you avoid sin's territory. It's easier to avoid temptation than it is to resist it. God uses clean vessels. Paul says, In a wealthy home there are dishes made of gold and silver, as well as some made from wood and clay. The expensive dishes are used for guests. The cheap ones are used in the kitchen, or put the garbage in. If you stay away from sin, you'll be like one of these dishes of purest gold, the very best in the house so that Christ himself can use you for his highest purposes. The great preacher D.L. Moody said, God doesn't seek golden vessels. He doesn't ask for silver ones. But he must have clean ones. Purity of both doctrine and life is the one indispensable condition for serving the living Christ. Paul says if anyone cleanses himself, he'll be a vessel of honour, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. When Paul uses the phrase, if anyone cleanses himself, he's talking about a cleansing that isn't just something that God does for us as we sit passively. This is self-cleansing for service. There is a main aspect of cleansing which comes to us as we trust in Jesus and his work on our behalf. This work of cleansing is really God's work in us and not our work. But there is another aspect of cleansing which God looks for us to do with the participation of our own will and effort. Not that it's our work apart from God, it's a work that awaits our will and effort, if anyone will cleanse himself. This aspect of cleansing is mostly connected with usefulness for service and closeness to God. While not exhaustive, Paul lists some of the things that we should purge out if we are to be used by God. Don't argue over unimportant things. Steer clear of foolish discussion. Run away from anything that gives you evil thoughts. Don't be quarrelsome or contentious. You can come to church and hear the truth of the word of God, but if you do not apply it to yourself, it does you no good. Even as a Christian, you cannot expect to have active in your life the tremendous provisions that God promises. You cannot expect to be used of God in beautiful and wonderful ways, unless you're willing to purify yourself and use the instruments that he has provided. There are many questions and challenges that face a church today. Do we believe that God has given us everything we need for faith and life in the Bible? Or do we suppose that we have to supplement the scripture with other things to make our ministry effective? The central message of 2 Timothy chapter 3 is that scripture contains everything we need God to tell us for life and faith. The first central truth is that we face difficult times ahead. The Apostle Paul warned his young protege Timothy that in the last days he was going to face difficult times. He said, You may as well know this as well, Timothy. In the last days, it's going to be very difficult to be a Christian. For people will love themselves and their money. They'll be proud and boastful, sneering at God, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful to them and thoroughly bad. They'll be hard-headed and never give in to others. They will be constant liars and troublemakers. 
They will betray their friends. They will be hot-headed, puffed up with pride, and prefer good times to worshipping God. Some people interpret the last days to refer to the time just before the second coming of the Lord Jesus. However, Paul was warning Timothy about the difficult times that he was going to face. So the last days must really refer to the entire time between Jesus' first and second coming. The description of the difficult times ahead was true not only for Timothy, but it's an accurate description of the difficult times ahead for us. Having just given a discouraging description of the difficult times ahead, Paul added, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. He's talking about professed believers. What makes his description so powerful is that the appearance of godliness cannot refer to non-Christians. Paul would not refer to non-Christians as having an appearance of godliness. In fact, elsewhere he referred to non-Christians and their various religions as ungodliness. The problem Paul is describing is not that the world will be evil in the final days before Christ's return, but that the church will be like the world as it is today. The church will be indistinguishable from the world. It will be equally corrupt, at least when you look beneath the surface. Paul's key to ministry was nothing other than the word of God. He said to Timothy, You must keep on believing the things you've been taught. You know that they're true, for you know that you can trust those of us who have taught you. You know how, when you were a small child, you were taught the Holy Scriptures. And it's these that make you wise to accept God's salvation by trusting in Christ Jesus. God's Word, the Bible, contains everything we need. God has taught us about faith and life. God's word is sufficient for evangelism and for cultural transformation. Paul exhorted Timothy to continue on the path of ministry because from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Why is the word of God able to do that? Because all scripture is breathed out or inspired by God. That is the scripture as the very word of God, and therefore it carries within it authority and power of God. Paul stated that the word of God is sufficient and, from the NIV, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Or from the authorised, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Or from the Living Bible, is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realise what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and points us to do what is right. It's God's way of making us well prepared at every point, fully equipped to do good for everyone. Deal Moody said the scriptures were not given for our information but for our transformation. The Bible isn't given for our opinion, it's the word of God. What you or I think of any particular passage is, in truth, pretty irrelevant. It's given to change our lives. 
Help us live as God wants us to live. The Bible should convict us when we're wrong and correct us, pointing us in the right direction. It should challenge us to teach us how to keep following God's path. The Bible is like a telescope. If a man looks through his telescope, he sees the worlds beyond. But if he looks at his telescope, he won't see anything else. To look at God's word, you'll see a message. But to study deeply, you go beyond that and understand the application to a wide spectrum of aspects of life. There are key questions you can ask as you get into the word. Is there a sin to confess? Either the Bible will keep you and me from sin, or sin will keep us from the Bible. Is there a promise to claim? You can't break God's promises by leaning on them. Is there an example to follow? What somebody did in a particular situation? Something for us to learn and put into practice. Is there a command to obey? The Bible has very few suggestions, but a lot of commandments. Are we being obedient to God and his word? Is there a stumbling block to avoid? People say we shouldn't reinvent the wheel, and I agree. We also shouldn't repeat the same mistakes as others, but rather learn from them. When studying scripture, we should look beyond the mere content. Look at the context, the verses before and after what you're studying, the time scale, the politics, the people. Compare scripture with scripture so that you can see the consistency of the whole book. Look at secondary sources for help and illumination. But be careful, because they are not inspired. It's a common technique of Satan to make us give up reading the word or praying because our enjoyment has gone, as if it were no use to read the scriptures when we don't enjoy them, as if it was no use to pray when we have no spirit of prayer. The truth is that in order to enjoy the word, we need to continue to read it. And the way to obtain a spirit of prayer is to continue praying. The less we read the word of God, the less we desire to read it. The less we pray, the less we desire to pray. If we can remain faithful to the word of God, the more faithful we will be to follow its guidance. Just as every word from the Bible is intended for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and for instruction in righteousness, so every word that comes out of our mouth has the potential to be for the benefit, profit, sustaining and fulfilment of someone else. Utter kind words to someone, a cheerful greeting to brighten someone's day. Show that you care for someone by what you say. Show them that they matter by taking an interest in them and their lives. Words should generally be shared to benefit someone else along the way. Paul is communicating to Timothy. When we talk, who are we trying to benefit? Who are we trying to please? Is it ourselves, which isn't necessarily wrong? But is it to purposely damage someone else, to hurt, to gain, in terms of benefiting us? Or is it to lift up Christ and to serve so that our light will shine, so that our works and words, whatever we do, will glorify God in heaven? Paul tells his friend to preach the word of God, or, as the message words it, proclaim the message with intensity. 
This is a calling to everyone. We all have a story to tell. How did we hear about Christ? What happened last week when I made a small prayer and the results were unbelievable? What incredible things did we have no earthly understanding of how it would happen, but Christ made it happen? What person did you meet that prayed for us about something we couldn't even pray for ourselves? And yet that prayer helped us get through or initiated something incredible to happen. What person did you pray with or walk with or just sat down next to silently crying that later came and told how their life had been changed? The greatest sermon we can preach is the life we live. Paul said, be prepared in season and out of season, or as the New Living Translation words it, be persistent whether the time is favourable or not. In season and out of season has led us to think simply in terms of being in church or out of church. I prefer the whether it's favourable or not. We're preaching the message of God in everything we do. We're communicating God's love, hope, joy, safety and deliverance in times when we are thinking and when we're not. Life is a terminal disease. The truth is, unless Jesus returns first, we will each reach that moment where we cross over from this life to eternity. What will it be like? Will we be at peace? Will we be ready? Will we be able to say, in respect of this earthly life, I finished well? In chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul is effectively preaching his own memorial service. He celebrates his life. He looks ahead to his heavenly home and he worships the Lord. His outline is simple. Paul speaks of his past, his present and his future. He begins in the present. God has given Paul a pretty clear indication that he is presently at the point of transition from this life to the next. Paul's death is imminent. He writes, I am already being poured out like a drink offering. He borrows the imagery from the Old Testament system of sacrifices. The drink offering, the priest would pour wine around the base of the altar as an offering to God. And Paul envisages his own life as already being poured out. The word already tells us that he anticipates death soon. He adds, for the time of my departure is near. The Greek word departure originally referred to a loosening of something, such as the mooring ropes of a ship or the ropes of a tent. When we reach that moment of transition from this life to our heavenly fate, we are loosed from the restrictions of mortality and freed at last to depart to heaven. Paul writes that his life is not a waste. No, his life is being poured out as a living sacrifice to his God. So Paul can live up to what he wrote earlier to the Philippian church when he said, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. As Paul suffers in a dungeon approaching death, he somehow grows closer to Jesus through his Lord's sufferings. Paul's faith grows stronger through adversity. I wonder if we can imitate his attitude in saying, Jesus, 
Help me not to wallow in self-pity, but to grow closer to you as I suffer alongside your suffering. Let my suffering remind me of how much you suffered for me. As Paul reviews his present situation, approaching the great transition, he considers his past. I can imagine him thinking back over 30 years of ministry as an apostle of Jesus, using military and athletic images. He says, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race. Paul gave it all he had, and he concludes, I've kept the faith. He's lived up to his beliefs. He's walked the talk. He's accomplished through God's power all that the Lord had called him to do. And so he is at peace. He's ready. Paul is used up, burned out and fully fulfilled. He has completed the life that God had for him to live on this earth. Paul didn't have the perfect life, far from it. In his writings he labelled himself as the least of the apostles and the chief of all sinners. Yet towards the end of his life he knew that he had surrendered all of his sin, all of his disappointment, all of his regret long ago to Christ and received God's perfect forgiveness. So now he can write, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Paul is at peace with his past. And that prepares him for his future. Paul not only wants to identify with Christ in his suffering, but also in his resurrection power. Paul knows without a doubt where he's heading. He spells it out in the next verse. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. The word crown, Paul uses another athletic image, the plated wreath that's placed on the head of winners of races. Earlier in his letter to the Corinthian church, Paul says everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. We don't know exactly what Paul meant by a crown of righteousness. He could be referring to the righteousness he gained by keeping the faith over a lifetime of following Christ. He could be talking about God's gift of righteousness. We know that our ultimate righteousness comes from God alone. None of us deserve heaven. None of us is without sin. Various New Testament writers mention crowns that God will give us in heaven. In addition to Paul's crown of righteousness, James talks about a crown of life and Peter the crown of glory. John quotes Jesus as giving the victor's crown. And John also gives a beautiful picture in Revelation of the elders laying down their crowns before Jesus as if saying, all of our best is nothing compared to your goodness. Because you are the very best of all, life, glory, righteousness, victory, all are gifts from God for those who will trust their lives to him. Have you given your past to Jesus? All your accomplishments as well as your regrets. Have you trusted your present to Christ, living every moment in thankfulness for the life that he has given you, becoming a living sacrifice for him to use? Have you trusted your future to him, certain that he will come for you 
in your appointed time and take you safely into that glorious future. Paul finishes his final letter with various statements and personal requests. To his great friend, he appeals, make every effort to come to me soon. If Timothy waited too long, he would miss the opportunity to travel to Paul, and then it would be too late. Paul is lonely due to lack of companionship from others. He says that one of the co-workers, Demas, has deserted him and gone back to Thessaloniki because he loved the world. Perhaps Demas grew tired of the poverty, persecution, hardness he had to endure as a companion of Paul. We don't know, but we can read into this statement much heartache on the part of Paul. Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. No negative comments attached, so they may well still be serving God. Paul just mentions them to underline his loneliness. Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus, who presumably, therefore, could relieve Timothy to enable him to come to Paul. Paul was not totally alone. He is encouraged by the presence of Luke, but he wants to see Timothy, and tells Timothy to bring John Mark with him. Now, John Mark was the young man who had gone home to his mother because he couldn't take the hardship of the first missionary journey and had upset the apostle by so doing. It's a tribute to Mark that he has somehow recovered himself in the apostle's eyes. And it's a tribute to Paul, too, that he found the grace to forgive and to forget the weakness of the past and give him another chance. Not only people, Paul asked for specific resources, a cloak, as the winter approached, books and parchments. As our Lord was dying on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. As Paul is facing a soon death, he showed a similar compassion, saying, at my first defence, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. One person who did not receive such benevolence was Alexander the Coppersmith. Paul said this man had done him a lot of harm, vigorously opposing the teaching of the gospel. And Paul concludes the Lord will repay him according to his deeds, although he did warn Timothy to be on his guard against this man. While Paul had declared that no one had supported him, everyone had deserted him, he stated that the Lord had always been faithful to him, standing with him and strengthening him. Despite the awful conditions in which he finds himself, Paul's heart for ministry is undimmed and his passion for the salvation of the Gentiles continues. If you would like to know more, then do contact us at any of the contact addresses given on this slide. Or, if you're in the Radstock area one Sunday morning, why not come along to the Baptist Church and join us for our 10.30 service. You'll always be very welcome. <laughs>